Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Kanas Albinas. Makalua. The man team. Mega Bears fan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Polycast, episode 369. Make your own joke here. I am one of your hosts, Canis Albinus, and I'm joined together in this chat room with Makalua. Oh, the nicest number for a podcast. The me and team. Writing the book on where your borders are located. And Mega Bears fan. There's 30 of the 69s. Ooh, that's too many. Debatable. <laughs> Depends on your point of view. And how much space is available, I suppose. In between last time we recorded and this time, now we know what we're getting in the next uh, Frontier Pass. We're getting Byzantium and Gaul and Dramatic Ages, which is, uh, Dramatic Ages is basically, yeah, forget a normal age. Either it's going to be a super bad Dark Age or a super, super Golden Age. Uh, and you're going to have access to the Dark Age and Golden Age policy. There's like an extended thing, I think, and Georgia got changed to being able to access both the Dark and Golden Age policies, or something like that. I think the idea with Dramatic Ages is no more dedications. Instead, you get policies that do the same thing. Yeah, there we go. That's the other part I missed. And you're always <laughs> in one or the other, Dark or Golden, never the, you know, blah, normal ages. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to tweak the... Uh requirements for those at all i would hope so because the the dark ages make you lose cities now so yeah it seems like, uh like they might want to adjust that at least at the first era there needs to be a reliable way to avoid dark ages if that's the outcome you're going to get as in, you, like, you can actually make choices that prevent a Dark Age if you play effectively and plan ahead well enough. Maybe not a good game... idea to, uh, to turn off barbarians and uh, tribal villages in this version. Yeah, you, you might well, that's what them. I'm thinking. I know in, in, my, uh, in my gaming experience, I solved this problem by just adding a mod that doubles natural wonders. That helps. Finding those wonders is worth a lot. Yeah. Yeah, if you could distribute the points you would get from the huts and such like that into other sources when those settings are disabled, it would be more reasonable. And there would be no worse time to have cities flip on you just outside your control than early in the game when the snow advantages tend to snowball. That would be really awful. I found that early in the game, though, is like one of the easiest places to get the Golden Ages because you're just doing so many of the you know expansion things anyway that give you points towards the uh, Golden Ages. Like one of the ones that I uh, or not even gold. Well, actually, I guess yeah, Normal Ages are what I get, not the uh, Golden Ages. But you know, the Golden Ages I find are still easier to get early in the game. So. Uh, one of the things that I a lot of times forget about when I get to that point where I'm getting close to the end of an uh, era and, like, I don't have enough points is I completely forget that, like, just building districts with good adjacency bonuses, like, it gives you go uh, era score. I think it's, like, all you need is, like, three or more adjacency bonus and you get, like, a one or two era score historic moment. I think every time, right? I don't think every time. I think uh, for each unique district, maybe. Oh, yeah, you might be the, right. Yeah, it's the unique district thing, yeah. I, I have seen people using that in other places. And we did also get at least two new wonders. I may be missing something in there, but there was the Statue of Zeus coming back. And the Biosphere, which is the 
mean, I know it because there's a race that happens on the island adjacent to it next to Montreal. That, but you see it in the background all the time on the shots of the track. So I'm like, ooh, it's that thing. Biodome de Montreal. Yes, it is that very one. Did they see what the uh, Statue of Zeus does? I don't remember. I don't remember either. I want to say... Let's check our cheat sheet, which is also known as the Christie's post in the Polycraft chat. Or Polycraft uh, chat. Statue of Zeus provides free military units in the city that builds it. Provides bonus production towards anti-cav. <laughs> Interesting. I remember it sounding really good when I read about it. I just don't remember exactly what it did. The biosphere boosts appeal for marshes and rainforests. Unless you're in Gathering Storm, where it provides power and tourism, it also provides science for every marsh, rainforest, and woods. I don't know about the anti-cav stuff. Well, I think that's also partly because they're adding Byzantium, which is super cav. So they want you to have something to be able to build the Statue of Zeus maybe early on to counter Byzantium. Oh, wait a minute. According to the Chris D, dramatic ages include era score for techs and civics, as well as military promotions. Era score earned over the threshold will now increase loyalty pressure from your citizens. Yeah, for the golden age. That's something I'd like to see just in the the base mm. game, just having an additional reward, even if it's a small one, for going over the requirement. Because, you know, there are, we've talked about this many times in the past, <laughs> there are just those you know, eras where every all the stars aligned for you, every, like, project and uh, wonder and stuff like that finishes at the same time, and suddenly you're 30 points over the uh, the requirement for your next Golden Age. And it's just like, well, that's all down the tube. It's like, yep. could I not get a boost during that age to reflect that I'm in, a, like, a super Golden Age of my own, you know? We also get a new map script, the Highlands map. Which is <laughs> no, I looked at mostly hills, hills and mountain ranges, almost entirely land based. Highlands Inca plus and e- yeah, Inca, Ethiopia, and I think even Korea would benefit from it. Everybody else is going, oh god. <laughs> and Greece, I think Greece has hill mm. bonuses. Yeah, for their Greece. unique theater districts. Anything that moves through bad terrain effectively would also like that map. Yeah, anybody with a cavalry unit or something that's got uh, extra movement or ignores uh, hills or whatever. Yeah. Also, Georgia gets a wild card slot during Golden Ages for. Um, yeah, Zero this is this is, yeah, this is the Georgia thing I was saying. I knew I was missing something else about that. They can pick the Zark policies even when they're in a golden age, and then they've got that extra wall card during golden ages, so And that's so in addition to their wall actually, bonus. They might be slightly large slightly higher than absolute garbage. <laughs> they might move up to the mm, eh, tier. Move up to the E tier instead of the F tier. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. I'd put them in the C tier if they have an extra wild card slot. So that's a C lot is of power. for card. <laughs> C is for card. Because they're a card. I didn't I even notice card that. Sometimes. Thank you. Now, we'll talk about Byzantium in a little bit, but according to what it looks like we can see in the video, it's possible that there's a. Uh, Gaul unique ability involving culture bombs from mines, which, if true, would be pretty impressive. Um, and there's also some kind of secondary encampment district that may be an industrial zone replacement. Hmm. But we don't have any actual details on that yet. Because there was no first look for Gaul yet. I'm sure we'll get that on Monday. Probably Monday, because Monday is the 21st, and then there's the developer stream on the 23rd, which is Wednesday, and then on Thursday, the DLC comes out. So, there's not a lot of time. Yeah, they uh, they really do hold off on these uh, first looks until, like, the last minute before releasing this stuff. 
Well, when you've only got a month between releases, you kind of have to be quick. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, I'm just glad we got the the look at Byzantium first for once before we recorded. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of which... Ah, yes. Byzantium. Or should I say Rome 2? We now have two Romes in the game again. Of course. Yet again. Always have to well, technically, if you want, if you want to be really cancerous, you could say there's four Romes now because we've got Rome, Byzantium, Ottomans, and Russia. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about those claiming the Rome, and and also, <laughs> but okay. I, I would even throw in a fifth. We also have Germany with the Holy Roman Emperor as the leader. We also have America, which claims to be a second Rome sometimes, too. <laughs> we better watch out we don't fall like it. We will eventually, but that'll be a few hundred years. Well, then it really would be like it. Anyway, Byzantium in-game structured uh, pretty heavily on both conquest and religion. Not too surprising, I suppose. Although, I, when I was watching the video, it wasn't clear what they meant by the unique unit bonus. Is it giving bonuses to religious combat only, or is it also boosting other units near it? I think it gives bonuses to both military units that are nearby and religious units that are nearby for their own spheres of combat. That was also my impression. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually a a decent bonus then. Any unit that boosts units around it is pretty nice. And uh, it's a night replacement, and those are decent units in the first place. Yeah, it might allow uh, Phil to win a religious victory, because it will just happen accidentally on his way towards the uh, conquest victory. (laughs) I I might have to actually make religious units. That's weird. It's not true. I made them a Spain to to bring along for the bonus at one time. Well, I want to see you try to pronounce the, the leader ability. Oh, I don't even remember it, so I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. Uh, I'll spell it for you. P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-O-G-E with an attenuation. G-G-E with a uh, long, little up down, upside down U, uh, E, upside down U over it. T-O-S. Too long. Can't Porphyrogenitos. I think it's Porphyrogenitos, but I also don't speak Greek, so I don't know. They got good boats. Their boats shoot further. The Dromans. The they cannot lie? The yes, Dromans they also shoot back. units better. So a range, yep. better. a range naval unit that actually has range. Yeah. yeah. Earlier in the game, yeah. I, I would taxis, thing. too. I would that like to say that... Really, in contrast to most naval uniques, uh... And in addition to that, unlike the Viking longship, it can kill land stuff. Although the Viking longship is pretty nice too, yes. especially when combined with all of the other uh, Norway abilities, they all add, come together and make that the longship really good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they buff pillaging. That... <laughs> oh yeah, that that I think like raised Norway like one or two tiers overnight. That's a pretty good yeah. bonus. Um, I, I do have to say though that I was I would kind of have hoped that the the Dromon would have been a medieval unit instead of just a replacement for the Quadrim because I do feel like there is a sad dearth of medieval naval units in uh, this version of the game. I feel it's one of like the biggest gaps that remains in the uh, uh, unit upgrade paths is there just not being any upgrades to naval units until you get to Caravels. Well, the problem with that is that in Western Europe especially, there wasn't really a lot of emphasis on naval stuff in the medieval era. There wasn't really much of an increase in technology between the bireme and trireme and quadremes of the Roman times to the time when the Arabs invented the, the caravel. There really wasn't a whole lot in there. They just used triremes. And uh, if you want to be technical about it, the trireme and the the bireme were all well used even up until the Napoleonic era because 
they were useful against sailing ships sometimes. So, because the, you could row against the wind, and that made them effective, which is why the Barbary Corsairs even existed for as long as they did. So, of course, we could do it the way that uh, Crusader Kings does it and just completely ignore the naval aspect altogether and just walk across the water. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Uh, I was. I've been playing that game as well, uh, the Crusader uh, Kings three, and I was frustrated that I couldn't intercept that you know enemy army that was sailing across the English Channel towards me before they got there. Just walk across the ocean. Yeah, couldn't in CK two either. Well, yeah, I, you, like they, they couldn't. You wouldn't fight with them. Yeah, you're definitely not wrong, Canis, but I, I still I do feel like I, I wish there were something, especially considering that those units do become so weak so quickly. Like, galleys and quadrimes just, like, cannot stand up to even ancient walls are, you know, get, are, you know pretty much just wipe out those units unless you just have a crap ton of them that you can rotate in or you've got a lot of uh, land support. So they just, I, I just feel like they become useless you know, too soon after you build them, and it would be nice to have a medieval upgrade that makes them, you know, viable again. Maybe just give them that a tech-based... Maybe just give them a tech-based strength increase? Yeah, I mean, something like that, I suppose, could work uh, as a, you know, compromise position, but I, again, like, you know, Civ Five had medieval upgrades for naval units, so they had the, the Gallius and... Uh, was there an upgrade to the, the melee one in the medieval era? I forget. Maybe not. There was not. But there's options, you know, there's like... There, this is one of those interactions where... They're just... They don't work all that well. Because, like, you can make a case historically, yeah, the ships weren't that threatening to cities, because the ships didn't have range, but the, the reverse was true, too. There was no good way, pre-cannons, to hit ships in the water, whereas in Civ... You get absolutely dusted by city walls. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's I'm another not sure problem where too, the compromise is, would be there. I, I really do feel like land units and cities should not be as strong at uh, bombarding naval units uh, as they are, especially early in the game. They they don't. It's not as bad later in the game. Like the frigates and stuff like that hold up pretty well to uh, bombardment from the land. But like the galleys and quadrimes, like fall in, historically like, too, in, like two hits. Of this could be fixed by just making cities not be ridiculous. Well, yeah, we've like, had that Archer discussion many a time. Just about nothing to boats, and generally vice versa as well. Uh, unless maybe archers it's promoted. Are pretty effective against, archers are pretty effective against triremes, though, because you can't really go below deck on a trireme. Yeah, like, I could maybe see there being, like, maybe, like, a, a fire arrow. Yeah, there's no way in history you could actually hit yeah, even if you had arrows that could reach no, out to bombard them, but what's an arrow going to do, even if it's a flaming pitch arrow or something like that? Because there, it's not like hitting I, a big... How think you can shoot arrows? Yeah, exactly. I mean, unless you had a ballista, but that was a medieval thing. I mean, yeah, you could catch ships in, like, a river or something with flaming arrows and be somewhat threatening to the ship. But if we're talking about, like, coastline ships no, yeah. at any point, I'm not buying that there's ever significant damage done it, it Maybe in a fluke scenario, like once or something, but there's just no credible threat from archers shooting at a people on a boat. Yeah, are you going <laughs> to tell me that all these city walls have managed to get those Archimedes mirrors that try to burn the ship, which, you know, Mythbusters show it doesn't work that great? And that would also be something that would give uh, early game siege units, like, another utility, because you would have to use those against uh, incoming naval units instead of your archers. I don't think those should be good against naval units either in the early game. No, but like, this is silly. But it would be something where at least it would give them a role besides the role that they're already awful at. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're they should just make is... them good at their actual role in beating cities and have done. That's all. They, they just need to be good at beating cities. That's it, and then nothing else. <laughs> I was going to say their current role is arrows is arrow cushions, <laughs> and they're not very good at it. Yeah, what were we supposed to be talking about again? <laughs> Byzantium. Oh, Byzantium, yeah. But the, um, we went off on a tangent because of Romans. Viable early game boats are really a problem in Civ Six in general, so maybe the Droman will, buff, uh, will uh, change that trend somewhat. But it'd be nice Well, it'd it, be nice if the early naval game was like not a complete mess. 
I, I actually general. I actually suspect that the the Dromon would probably actually be a very good uh, unit because that two <laughs> range means that you can shield it with your galleys and still actually hit things. And like aside from archers on the coast and city bombardment, quadrimes aren't going to be able to hit it. So it's it's going to be basically invincible on like the open waters because you've also got you know early in the game the ships can only travel along coasts, which means they're constrained to that like one or two tile wide you know, uh, you know, snaky channels of shallow water that they can only go into. So uh, the Dromans can potentially be a, a game changer if there's any actual early game naval action going on. You're going to, you know, Byz Byzantium's going to dominate the seas in that sense. Maybe in the archipelago map, but any other time, like, nobody's going to be building any boats for you to kill. Yeah, that's and the problem. I'm not convinced they're going to have enough strength to be threatening the cities, but maybe they will. Maybe they, uh, Maybe they'll be strong enough that even after people get swordsmen out and such, they won't be just dead in the water, literally. Well, and if they're also useful against hitting units on the uh, on land, that could also make them yeah, you know, that's helpful. True. If you can clear out the units before your land army gets to the cities, that you know would also be helpful. But uh, I, I kind of get the feeling that the the heavy cav unit is supposed to be more the the point of Byzantium, anyway. So the the Droman might be like the weaker of the two. Yeah, because because we get that a lot with the civs where they have a powerful ability or a powerful unit, and then like a you know to say it generously, a not so powerful ability or not so powerful unit. And in the other civ games, it was a the cataphract or mounted unit was always there. Yeah, selling point. So who's the leader of Byzantium? Basil the second. Not Justinian. Not Justinian. And not Theodora. Yep. Completely new leader. I was kind of hoping that the leader for Byzantium would be just both of them at the same time. I thought that would have been... I think I've talked about that before on the show. I think it would have been like a funny little gag. Byzantium, led by Mehmed. Wait, what? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so, for anybody who's questioning, Poferogenitos means uh, born of the purple. And it's a and what it does is it gives cavalry full damage to cities following Byzantium's religion. Ah, uh, okay. Trying to make cavalry into what it once was. Now, just to be clear, that doesn't mean that the cavalry are hitting the city through the walls. It just means that they are not being penalized against cities, which I think is what uh, cavalry normally have. Like, what is it, like a minus five or something like that against something cities? Something like that. I yeah. think it's more severe than that, but yeah. Minus seven, maybe? Something like that? I don't remember the, the value, but it's pretty rough attacking cities with cavalry, unless they're already, like, shredded. Uh, yeah, I, I never use my cavalry to go into the city until, like, it's basically already down to zero HP from bombardment, so I, yeah. I, I've completely forgotten what that penalty was, because I just remember that it was enough of a deterrent that I don't ever use cavalry to attack cities anymore. That still annoys me. A lot of the changes annoy me, though, to make defending more easy in Civ 6. Because in my opinion, that was the wrong direction to take the game. But that's, that's irrelevant to Byzantium. They have an entertainment complex called the Hippodrome. Yep. Another Civ 4 returning unique. Plus three amenities instead of plus one, and a bonus free cavalry when the district and its buildings are constructed. And that I think plus it doesn't have maintenance either on that cavalry, which is interesting. And that plus three amenity is a big deal because I think the last patch, which we may or may not have talked about, because uh, it happened on that uh, off week where we didn't record last time, uh, they changed the requirements for getting happy and ecstatic. So it's something like now you need, I think, three amenity, extra amenity in the city to get to happy as opposed to just having one extra and you need five to get to uh, ecstatic. So, I don't know if they changed the the base entertainment complex. Is the base entertainment complex plus two amenities now or is it still just one? I think it's just one. Yeah, so having enough uh, amenity to get you all the way up to happy 
you know, all else being equal, is a pretty good uh, bonus. Considering how weak entertainment complexes are now, because, you know, you only get one third of the way there. Yeah, and then there's the the ability, which I think is unique to Basil, which is Texas. Plus three combat religious dream for every holy city converted to Byzantine's religion, including their own. And all of the non-barbarians killed spread their the Byzantium's religion as if it was theological combat. Oh, yeah, and plus one, plus one profit point from holy sites. But uh, all non-barbarians killed every time you get in a war, it's like you're having the combat and going, boo, boo, boo. I mean... You're going to win. You could actually literally accidentally win religious victory this way. Yeah, I can <laughs> yeah. see the high difficulties where the AI likes a lot of units that uh-huh. starting that up. Well, and it, it also sounds like these abilities like just like flow really or feed into each other really well. Because yeah. it sounds like your conquest converts the cities, and then the conversion of the cities increases the strength of your units. So it's this like p- potentially devastating spiral. Of uh, you know, re- uh, religious conversions and unit combat strength improvements. Yeah, Byzantine's going to have to go on the list of those ones you watch early, so they don't turn into a runaway. Right, because if they just get like one or two other civs converted, like you're talking about a substantial bonus. Yeah, if, if we're understanding how this works correctly. That yeah, that'll add up. Maps. What was that, Canis? Deadly on big maps. Oh yeah, with more civs, you got a sixteen civ <laughs> deathmatch going on. Uh, how many religions you have is nine that? Nine holy cities. Nine holy cities. Yeah, that's uh, th- that's starting to get to the point of being a full era worth of military strength this year. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, I'm looking Rolling at down the, the hill that far. I'm looking at the Well of Souls uh, website from uh, Ariok, and it's uh, it looks like it's plus three combat strength for each holy city. So, yeah, even on a standard yeah. eight-player map, you've got, I think, what is it, five holy cities? So yeah. that's... Uh, and their own included. Yeah. Realistically, if you've conquered, now, like, two or three holy cities, though, you've probably won as anybody. Well, uh, but even so, it's a it's a substantial bonus for closing up the game. Now it does mean but you don't that have to you... conquer them; you just have to yeah. convert them. Yeah, well, consider. okay, but like, okay, if you're fighting the AI, I guess sure. Nobody who's trying would allow you to convert their holy cities. Otherwise, yeah, multiplayer would be different, it. but in single player, that's going to be ridiculous. Just kill it with military units. One thing I, I do have to say, though, it sounds like uh, for Byzantium, like even more so than a lot of other religious-themed um, civilizations, it is absolutely critical to make sure that you do found one of those religions. Because if you don't found your own religion, you don't ever actually have your own religion, which means it sounds like none of these bonuses would come into play. So even if you conquered someone else's holy city and you know their religion is the majority in your cities, that's still not your religion, as per Civ Six's game mechanic. So you would get nothing for that, as far as I understand, because you can't convert other cities to your religion if you don't have a religion of your own. You get extra profit points as Byzantium, though, right, from their district? Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah one. Maybe, so but can... again, on, on higher difficulties, those religions go fast. So, like, the holy site needs to be, like, the first thing that you build. Yeah, but you actually have a chance at it because you have the increased rate towards that profit. True, yeah, that, that certainly helps. Yeah because, yeah, because even one extra point, even if you're on your first holy site, is a lot of a bonus. Yeah, I'm just comparing that to like Spain or something, where you really benefit from religion, but good luck. Right. Yeah, but it's just one of those scenarios where like, if you go for like the campus and the government, you know, plaza first, like, you might miss out on get. you're probably going to miss out on getting that religion on any difficulty yeah. higher than like, king. Yeah. But Byzantium, you're going to know in advance that you really, really need to have that religion. So you're going to probably prioritize that above the campus, unless you, except maybe at deity or something like that, you know. I'd probably still try to get it somewhat quickly. Yeah, and this is the thing where, again, like I said earlier, even Phil might uh, build religious stuff. Well, I mean, you're offering me at least three combat strength for just investing in this. Yeah, for every unit. And I assume that also includes naval and air units, too. Uh, unless it says, does it say know. anywhere that it's only land units? Land units only. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
It's okay. Those are the units that matter for most of the game. Poor Dromon doesn't get its religion bonus. Yeah. It doesn't need it. Maybe it doesn't need it. We'll see what its actual statistics are when... I don't know, the, the ability on, on Well of Souls uh, just says units, so I don't know if you if there's a different source somewhere that specifically says land units, so it, it might, maybe it is every unit. I don't know. It's kind of funny to think of planes getting this bonus, especially in the context of Byzantium, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's funny to think of planes in the context of Byzantium to begin with, so... Yeah. <laughs> The, the the great Byzantium Air Force. Yeah, it's like getting rushed out by U.S. horse archers or something. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the other big news that happened in the last two weeks regarding civilization, and that was Sid Meier's memoir came out. And I have read the book. It is a very good book. We should all read it. And it is one of those things where you just read and read and read because it's just a story of all the games he made. Also, he has really good taste in music. Would you say that it has one more page addictiveness? I would say so. It also has achievements. <laughs> oh, really? How does that work? <laughs> if you read, like, you read and there's a little uh, asterisk next to something, and it'll be uh, achievement unlocked, name of achievement. Uh, and it's oh, you read about four different people in this game, in this book, that kind of thing, or make it halfway through the book, or read the first page, or finish the book. <laughs> it is very entertaining, especially when he's talking about all the things that he thinks are silly about um, bad design. Um, those are entertaining because he rags on himself when he makes mistakes and says, I didn't like this game. Specifically, covert action. Huh. Huh. Because yeah, a lot of it, I've heard plenty of good things over here for covert action from people, so it's kind of odd to hear that, like, ah, I didn't like the way that worked. Uh, he, he says, the problem with covert action is there's two good games in there, but two good games is worse than one great game. Ah. And it turns out that Civilization itself was kind of like the weekend project for a while, and then he and one other guy got assigned to it, and they made it so good that people were like, oh, well, massive sales, but we're a corporate, so we don't think it's a good game, so we're not going to make Civ 2. So they gave it to one guy and sent him to Europe. They exiled him. <laughs> well, his, his wife was working or was doing a something at Oxford or something. Oh, okay. This is Brian Reynolds. But I did not, not know that Sid Meier was a Swiss citizen as well, and that he spent some time living in Switzerland as a kid. That's where he decided that he liked railroads, and that's where uh, Railroad Tycoon came from. I think it would be very hard to not, or very hard to live in anywhere in Europe and not come to very much like railroads. <laughs> hey, I've never lived in Europe, and I like railroads. Yeah. I mean, I've visited railroad or I visited uh, Europe like a couple times, and just like in general, public transit is just phenomenal. Like, I come, I, I live in a city that has like no public transit, like whatever, other than like a crappy bus network that breaks down every day because it's 115 friggin' degrees out here. Uh, so, like, just being able to hop onto a train and, you know, or a subway or whatever, or even, like, a working bus, <laughs> as in the case in uh, London, and get somewhere to do something is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 rail is a huge deal to U.S. history, but these days... Not so much for civilian usage. <laughs> I should say, uh, like everyday person, like it's mostly business stuff. If you live in very specific places in the U.S., you can ride a train. Yeah, yeah, I've been to places like in the U.S. Illinois, that have... Illinois, California, and the the Boss Wash Corridor. Other than that, you are very lucky if you even have one train ride. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's light rail in a lot of the major cities, but it's not necessarily the same thing as train train. Yeah, I, I've been to like uh, Dallas, and I had a pretty positive experience with Dallas's uh, light rail system. Mm -hmm. Although, to be fair, I only used it to go to like two places. So, uh, yeah, um... but I can get from where I am out in the northeast corner of the county and down into downtown to go to like uh, games at American Airlines Center. So, I mean, <laughs> considering yeah. the, the drive there and everything else in the traffic, I yeah. Yeah, like in Europe, I mean, you can just hop on a train and like within an hour you can be in, you know, another country. I mean, like we did that. Yeah. We were in uh, in Copenhagen and we just hopped onto the train and went across the uh, the channel to, um, crap, I forget the name of this. I want Malmo, I want to say. In, yeah, Sweden. Uh, yeah, in Sweden. And, and it was funny because like they, they didn't even check passports or anything. I mean, we just got on the train and went to another country. And it was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. Well, the, the distance yeah. there is not... Huge. Uh, this is between some of the U.S. states. Yeah. Is that would be like wild. me getting on a train and going to, like, Chicago. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the distance between countries in Europe is, you know, analogous to the distance between states in, you know, the United States. Sometimes. If you're going, like, from the northern to southern tip of Florida, or, God help you, Texas, <laughs> you know, <laughs> east to say, west. Yeah. East to west, or even north to south in Texas. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Either I'm not sure that to going ages. from Lisbon to Paris is shorter than going from El Paso to Houston. <laughs> well, Fran wait, 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 this, this is in Turncast one time, but we looked it up, and France is about the same square mile area as Texas, so yeah. Yeah, but France is more close to a uh, square than is Texas. So if <laughs> you go from the extreme ends of one side of Texas to the other, it's a, probably a greater distance. If you take I-10 across the state of Texas, it's a thousand miles. So if you're taking a Interstate 30 from what we're or Interstate 10 from, I believe it's, is it San Diego or Los Angeles to Jacksonville? You spend a third of the time in Texas. When I drive from where I live to Brownsville, Texas, it's. I'm in Texas by the second day, and it takes three days to get there. Yeah. Texas is literally... The Texas border is the halfway point of that trip. Anyway, Texas is big. We know. Yeah, but yeah. it is an illustration of the United States is so big, we can't have a rail system quite the way Europe has a rail system. Because that's each country is invested in its individual area, and it would be really difficult to get individual states here to do the same kind of investments, to make a big big rail link that would connect the whole country. To be well, clear, though, I wasn't, remember. Even, I wasn't even necessarily talking about, you know, interstate rail. I was just talking about, like, public transit within a city. Like, just having oh, yeah. a rail system in the city is nice. Yeah, there's not much excuse for it to be as bad as it is in the U.S. There's no excuse, but there is a reason. Oh, yeah, for sure. They wanted to sell buses. There's a city near me that tried to build a subway, and they built some of it, and then discovered that nobody wanted it. So now it's just abandoned. Well, you have to... You, there's also, like, a, a certain amount of, um... Like, the the public takes sometimes takes a while to buy in. Because I know when, um... Like, when roundabouts first started showing up, like, people hated them. Like, and you had public opinion polls where, like, 90% of the people, like, surveyed were like, I hate them, I don't know how to use them, like, I want them to just go back to having regular intersections with lights. But then, like, you come back to that same place, like, five, ten years later, and you poll the people, and you have, like, 90% approval. Like, oh, the roundabouts are awesome, we love them. There's roundabouts, there's a couple roundabouts near me, and I hate them with a passion. <laughs> They're great when they're used appropriately, but sometimes they have an intersection and they don't know what else to do. And it's like, uh, roundabout? Roundabout, because because progress. Oh, wait, you mean there's big trucks that use this intersection? Oh, well, I guess that means only one truck per uh, entire revolution in this entire intersection. Yeah, I mean, the roundabouts definitely have their place. And, like, heavily trafficked roads with, you know heavy trucks on them is probably not one of the good use cases for roundabouts, but for like smaller roads where you just have, you know, uh, you know, private vehicles, uh, with low to medium traffic density, like they're very efficient. So yes, actual results may vary. I like how we got here from Sid Meier's uh, <laughs> memoir. 
<laughs> yes, the takeaway well, from this episode of Polycast is Texas big, trains good, roundabouts sometimes good. <laughs> uh, it's Sid and all of his railroads. He got us on this path. What else happens in that book? Oh, if, uh, he had tragedy in his early life, but it wasn't the kind that you'd expect. He had a sister that died of cancer when she was very young, so... Oh. That is sad. That's why he went to Switzerland, was to protect him from that. Ooh. He was eight, living in Switzerland. And apparently when he uh, came back to America, he had forgotten how to speak English. Oh, yeah, if you're deeply... Yeah, if Switzerland... Cause, and that, that's like... They, it's their own dialect of German, too. So you're immersed in that all the time. It's what you're speaking on a day-to-day basis. Oh, right. And especially when you're so young, too. It just sort of probably supplanted it in his... Uh, the Yeah, supplanted English in his brain. So when he came back, it's like... The English was probably still there, but it probably took a while for him to get it back. Well, I don't know how it was, you know, back when Sid Meier was eight years old. But I know that, you know, a few year, as of a few years ago, when I was visiting Europe, I mean, everybody in Germany, in Denmark, in Sweden, everybody spoke you know, fluent English, English, and it would be funny because they would apologize about like not being very good at speaking English. And I'm like, man, I went to high schools in the United States. Your your English is better than most American high school students, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's certainly better than my French or my German or my Danish. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, that is a more modern thing because I started teaching it as a, like a required course in schools. Whereas about the time that Sid was probably over there. They hadn't quite made that change yet. That's a problem that people have now. They want to go to a country and get immersified in one of those languages. But then as soon as somebody knows they speak English, they're like, you know, they start speaking to them in English instead of their target language. And it's like, but I wanted to speak the other language with you. I, I do want to share. I have one funny anecdote from being in uh, in Denmark uh, involving the language barrier. It was we were at an amusement park and I wanted a drink, and I was trying to ask the staff there if there were drinking fountains, and they kept telling me, uh, "No, no, no drinking fountains, but you can go and drink from the toilet." And I was like, "Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I are, are you sure there aren't? You wash your hands. <laughs> are you sure there aren't <laughs> drinking fountains?" <laughs> somewhere and they're like no 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 it's uh, the, the water in in denmark is very clean you can definitely drink out of the toilet it's perfectly safe and, and we're having this discussion going back and forth until eventually i come to realize that when they say toilet they just mean like the sink in the bathroom like the word toilet means like the entire restroom yeah. so they just meant go into the restroom and and you know take a cup or something and get water out of the tap from the sink but the word they used was toilet <laughs> So you're like, wait, hold up. All right, get on your hands and knees. <laughs> so, yeah, that was... Oh, my but, goodness. But that was the only, like, big language hurdle that I had, you know, spending a week in Denmark, was uh, them telling me to drink from the toilet. That's great. <laughs> All right. I think we should get back on topic. We've wasted enough time. <laughs> but that is a good story. Thank you. I, I enjoy it. Uh, where the heck were we? We came to for giving a account of the cue. book. Yeah, I was going to say, if he had anything else, now's the time to say it. I would recommend it. Go buy it, go read it, go enjoy yourself. Okay, so uh, now that we are done with our lengthy uh, diversion, I guess we can go back to talking about uh, that uh, silly civilization game or whatever it is that we're supposed to be talking about. Uh, we have a forum post on Civ Fanatics from user Salty Mud titled Civilization 6 is not a sequel to 5, but instead to Civilization 4. And um, the general idea of this uh, topic is that uh, this user feels like Civ 6 feels more like it's an iteration on Civ 4 than on an, than an iteration on uh, Civ 5, which um, I can definitely see, understand the point, but I, I personally, I think it's, it's both. Uh, I think it iterates on the ideas from um, 
from both games. I mean, first and foremost, you have uh, Civ Five had the idea of unstacking armies with the one unit per tile, and Civ Six followed that up with the idea of unstacking cities with the uh, district mechanic. So there's a definitely a clear lineage uh, that I see between th- those two. But at the same time, Civ Six definitely does take a lot of ideas and inspirations from uh, Civ Four. For instance, the social policy system reminds me a heck of a lot more of the civics of uh, Civ Four than it does to the social policies of Civ Five. So uh, I definitely understand the user's point, but uh, I, my two cents is I think it's it's more an amalgamation of ideas from uh, both games. I would agree. Um... I think Civ Six is mostly just Civ Five, but better. Better in some ways. I I think Civ Five did certain things better than Civ Six does. Uh, like I I kind of prefer the trade route mechanics of Civ Five and the uh, Great Works, and particularly the theming mechanics in museums for Civ Five. Uh, I feel like it was a little bit more user friendly and uh, easier to work with. It was um, more obvious what was going on. Yes. Yeah. And I can stare at the the uh, the culture victory panel in Civ Six for like hours, and like still really not be able to make sense of what the heck it's trying to communicate to me. Uh, whereas in Civ Five, stuff like that was a lot more straightforward. Uh, but yeah, Salty Mud has uh, a few bullet points here. Uh, the first one is that city management is more in depth. Um, definitely agree with that one. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, really in depth in more in depth in the same way that Civ Four was, uh, and in fact, I, I feel like there's even more micromanagement in Civ Six than there was in Civ Four because in Civ Four you weren't controlling trade routes, you weren't, uh, uh, you know, obviously you weren't building districts and stuff like that. You weren't dealing as much with adjacency bonuses from the the terrain. It was just you know assigning your citizens to work tiles. Uh, but um, I would agree that. You know, it's the city management is definitely more in depth. I don't know if that necessarily makes it more like Civ Four than Civ Six or Civ Four than Civ Five, though. I think uh, it sorely lacks the the specialists. Yeah, that is one thing that I do miss from Civ Five and Four and Three. And to be clear, the the specialists are still there in Civ Six. They just suck. They don't give great person points, so they're not useful. And it's like well, and their yields yield. are impressive. Like if you had really good yields from specialists, yeah, you know, the, and the, they, the, they cost you food, but it, they were that was a worthy trade off. That'd be a different story. If they either fed themselves by producing two food, I would even be happy with just one food, so that they they you know supplement themselves a little bit. But alternatively, if like a, a scientist specialist were generating like five science per turn instead of two science per turn, then maybe we're talking about... Maybe you got something there, but like, last I checked, they're generating like two yield, which is just pathetic. I don't know, maybe they got buffed at some point in patches. It's been so long since I've looked at them. Yeah, I kind of forgot they existed. Like, not really, but sort of. Like, I just... (laughs) After trying to use them a few times and looking at the trade-offs, I started pretending they weren't there. But yeah, if they, like, got stealth buffed or they got buffed and I missed the patch note on it or something, maybe. Maybe it could be good now, but probably not. And then, uh, the next point from Salty Mud is playing the map is more important, uh, which, again, I definitely agree with, and I think this is, like, one of, if not the, like, single strongest points of Civ Six is how important the map is, and how, especially in Gathering Storm, the map itself, like, almost kind of becomes a character within the game, uh, and in some sense even an antagonist with the disasters and stuff. Yeah, I would say that's one of the areas Civ Six is closest to four. And, and I would that, say it probably surpasses four because you know the. I that depends. Cause there's some really between like train move promotions and things like the Great Lighthouse, or how trade routes even without Great Lighthouse, how trade routes scale uh, across water versus not. And so for. Uh, there, there's I'm not getting into everything, but the, there's quite a lot that the map shapes in so four as well. So I'm not convinced that Civ 6 necessarily surpasses it, but it, it definitely gets that same feel. I feel like in Civ 4, though, a lot of it was more like just 
passive stuff, like you said, like the trade routes, the player didn't have hardly any control over. It just kind of automatically. It affected the placement, though. And it affected yeah. the kinds of tiles he worked. It, it, it affected the degree to which you would make tile improvements as opposed to other things. And yeah. where you play cities. Like, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. It and again, I, I did not play Civ 4 nearly to as high a level as a, you know you were. I was playing Civ 4 at like a, you know Prince difficulty for most of the time I was playing it. So my opinions of, of Civ 4 are, are biased in that regard. So I will yield to your opinion. I, I think they're pretty comparable, honestly. Yeah, and, like, I, I got out like a measuring stick and started really delving into like the nuances of both. Maybe I could give an opinion that one is a little bit better than the other. But you know, the the overarching takeaway is that you, in both cases, the map will dictate choices that you wouldn't otherwise make, and sometimes those can be pretty meaningful as to how the game progresses. And that is one of the strong points for both. Whereas Civ Five was less so in that regard. And in Civ Five, I feel like the map was like mostly just a a battlefield, like that was pretty much the only thing that it does was like the the most use you got out of the map was trying to create like choke points and stuff like that with the uh, you know fortifications or citadels or you know city bombardment. Because where you put the cities really wasn't all that big of a deal in Civ Five, other than you know whether or not they would be defensible. For city tradition, go. I mean, it got better, of course, with uh, particularly the Brave New World expansion, which did add the trade routes, where the you know water routes were way better than the land routes, and you know building coastal cities with access to water became more important. But again, it was a a relatively minor uh, consideration. River cities were good in Civ Five because it gave you trading um, the city. Um connection bonus. That's true, but I would also say that placing cities next to rivers was also important in Civ 4 and Civ 6, so I don't, yeah. know, I, I, would, I don't know if I would say more or less so, but, you know, at least as important. Let's see, and then the next point is something that I already alluded to, which is that the policy cards of Civ 6 uh, feels more like the civics of Civ 4, which uh, I already... You know, talked about. I totally agree with that. I, I definitely like the idea of changing your policies during the course of the game uh, based on the situation and having to actually make you know meaningful decisions with uh, with real trade offs as opposed to the Civ Five system where it's just a, a cumulative growth where you're just stacking bonuses on top of bonuses. Yeah, I think this is one of the areas where Civ Six is the strongest in all the series. It, it does have the Civics feel, but it's def- it has more depth. Uh, the policy cards have more depth. Yeah, it's real genuine decision making. And some of these are tough decisions, especially like with the, you know, governments in the first half of the game where you only have like four or five uh, policy slots. Like, you know, deciding between, you know, something like uh, what town charters. Do I want 100% adjacency bonus for my commercial hubs or do I want it for my industrial zones? Like, that's a, I can only pick one, but which one's it going to be? That's a p- really impactful decision. And even just deciding between the governments themselves, because that's going to affect what you're doing. Because, like, the first three that you get to, one's one's kind of either way, but one's more military-focused than the other is wonders and growth-focused. And I do have to say that I actually am using the other governments a lot more than I used to be. Like, for a long time in Civ VI, it, I liked the... You know, the democratic, the classical republic, you know, uh, government and the follows up that had more of the economic policy cards. Uh, I, I just felt like those were so much stronger than the, the military or the, uh, uh, what was it, diplomatic policy cards, the green ones. Yeah. But yes. I, I find that in, especially since playing the New Frontiers Pass, I've been using the other governments and using more military cards and stuff like that a lot more than it had been in the past. So I don't know if, if there were things that changed or if it's just the, the different civilizations are making me approach the game differently. Uh, I'm, but I'm definitely getting a lot more mileage out of the government and, and policies recently than I had been uh, when Civ Six first came out. I I love AI that <laughs> you have, you've actually lived to the point where you have all Garaki available. The strength bonus is pretty helpful against uh, what they have, so that made a big difference. 
Yeah, but I'm even finding that I'm using autocracy, you know, from time to time now as well. Like, it, it, for a long time it was like, oh, do I want classical republic or do I want oligarchy for that early war rush and conquering my neighbor? Uh, but now, like, I'm, I take a serious look at, uh, at autocracy as well. Yeah. And also, a, a big benefit to the policy carts is the marginal benefits you can get out of long-range planning as well. Uh, like, thinking about when you'll swap out which card for what and planning around that with how you're building your empire otherwise. You, there's a lot of room for optimization there. Right, like and I'm going to swap only... in limes, and I'm going to build all of my walls in every city, you know, over this next, like, five turns, and then, you know, switch to something else. Yeah, yeah, that, that like, the only thing that came close to rivaling that was some of the uh, worker turn micro in Civ Four. But I'm not sure that that's actually more complex than and, the well, and the, the worker, the builder micro is still there too. Because again, going back to that example with the limes policy, uh, not only am I building my walls in all the city, but the fact that that card offers a hundred percent bonus means I also want to chop more during that period because I'm going to get double the yield from chopping as well. And I I don't know if the carryover bug is still there where the you get the one hundred percent applied to the next build in your queue as well. Okay, they fix that. Did uh, did they have it? okay? Yeah, I, I, I still. I'm almost certain they fixed that. Like I still a while do back. that out of habit, like just in case, because I keep forgetting whether or not that <laughs> that did change. Um, but yeah, like y y I would rather do the chopping with a policy like limes than a policy, you know, like say the plus fifty percent towards military units, because you're going to get more bang for your buck. Although there was, uh, I mean, that is one of the ways, I guess, it's more like Civ 4. Because there was a period in Civ 6 where you could apply the bonuses for chopping and the bonuses for walls, and then over, like, get the walls nearly finished, then chop for, for double overflow, and get a ton of production from that. Which is just right out of the, the protective overflow, uh, protective trade overflow playbook in Civ 4 before they uh, unfortunately introduced a bug in overflow and never fixed it in Civ 4. Uh, but just before they broke it, the Protective had that trick in Civ 4. <laughs> it was like almost the same idea in Civ 6. That's quite a robot. I was uh, going to ask if that was just me. How long was I roboting? Just for the last like 15 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so basically. No big uh, deal. Yeah, I was just going on about how they broke uh, overflow in Civ Four, but before that, it was uh, it was a very similar tactic: the overflowing walls in Civ Four and overflowing walls in Civ Six. Yeah, uh, and moving on, uh, Salty Mud's next point is probably going to be the most controversial uh, in in their list, which is uh, the return to the more cartoony uh, art style, which I know a lot of people playing Civ Six hate. I've defended in in the past because I feel like it it conveys a lot more information about the game state to the player than the more photorealistic uh, graphics of um, Civ Five, and also like you know, to to be honest, things like uh, the scaling of unit sizes versus like cities and the environment looks sillier in Civ Five because it's more realistic than in you know Civ Six because it is so cartoony. Uh, but that's you know kind of. A, a different thing. Uh, so this user likes the art style. I like the art style. Um, I've, the only thing place where I think it's a, a weakness is I do like Civ V's leader screens more because they had the, the the 3D animated backgrounds as opposed to just like you know a painting in the back, which I think is kind of bland. I, I preferred the leader being in an environment. Um, but yeah, that's just a purely aesthetic, superficial uh, thing. And they may not be, the leaders may not be photorealistic, as it were, but they have personality to them. That's you know, true. They all, have, they all have their little gestures and things, and you get the idea of that they don't like what you've done, or they're like, oh, you've done great. And sometimes they're, their lines or the way that they've made them move when they're saying their lines, is, it's, it's humorous, you know. Yeah, the, the animators did a really good job with the leaders. And again, my complaint yeah. wasn't with the leaders themselves, it was, it's yeah, with the backdrops. It's, uh, the, and the, yeah. the the paintings are beautiful, right? Like put those on a loading screen or something like that. But I I liked the um the the 3D environments and you know how some of the leaders moved around in that environment. You know, like you had like George Washington over there in Civ Five was playing with his little globe whenever he got bored with whatever you were saying, uh, stuff like that. Like I I miss those sorts of little 
details, which I think would have looked really good in Civ Five, considering how well, or in Civ Six, considering how well the leaders are animated. Like if they actually had an environment to play around in, like I, I just feel like it would be so much better. I kind yeah, of agree. We, yeah, if we could have both, that would be great. I mean, maybe this was one of those time crunch decisions where it was less work to get all the animations done than to try to do that and do backgrounds or something. Yeah, and there's so much extra production quality in so many places in Civ Six, mm -hmm. right? Like, this is one tiny little nitpicky detail. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, compared to Civ Five, like, the production quality of Civ Six is just, like, through the roof. Like, Civ Five came out with a very unfinished feel, and Civ Six came out, you know, feeling like a complete game, like with all of the art and assets and music and everything in place and working very well and just looking very pretty in motion. Uh, which leads into the next point from Salty Mud, which is the uh, music and specifically the way that the music changes each era and uh, for each uh, leader. And again, I, I think the, the music in Civ Six is just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Firaxis hit it out of the park. I mean, the, the Civ music soundtracks are always good. Right, like I enjoyed the Civ Four soundtrack that came with the the game, uh, except the late eras. Ugh. Yeah, well, there was too much minimalism. Um, but yeah, Civ Six's uh, musical compositions are just absolutely fantastic, and the way that they they add like more advanced instruments and like a more modern, you know, like poppy feel to a lot of the the songs as the the eras progress into the later eras, really adds a lot of uh, texture to the game. Like you can hear like, what era of the game you are in, right? Just close your eyes and listen to the game, and from the sounds of the districts and the sounds of the music, like, you know you're in, like, the modern era compared to, like, the classical era. And it builds up because a lot of the melodies start very simple and then get more complex and more complex. To the, by the time you get to the modern era, it's these, like, symphonic pieces. And it... Because the game sort of scales, it gets simpler and it gets more complex. It, you know, it goes along with it. You get some of the feeling going with that. And then, and then you get to the atomic era, and everything becomes modern music, like rock music almost. Right. But still, auto -tunes, the auto tuned Zulu. I'm not sure I like that one, but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to vary from leader to leader, but e even the modern era music does maintain that the cultural, you know, feel that you've you've listened through the whole game. It's not just, uh, gosh, what's the name of that song that was at the end of uh, of Civ Five in the modern era? I, I forget the name of it, but people are the heroes. Yeah, yeah, that was That's it. Civ Four. Oh right, was yeah, it Civ Four? Oh, Civ Four. <laughs> we remember. I know. It so well. I know that... that tells you something. I know that that song was particularly popular on this show for some reason. But it's about freaking Nazi, or not Nazis, uh, communist Russia, China, and I'm not particularly happy about that. Yeah, we use it Especially for like our the, outro or something, don't we? It it I used to be the uh, the feedback section, basically. The feedback, the open mic. Oh yeah, that's that right. one. Well, that's also not the reason why we <laughs> don't use it anymore. By the way, we would use it, but I just haven't uploaded it to the the software yet and then of course both Civ 4 and Civ 6 also had the uh the, their main musical themes composed by Christopher Tin who we've talked about uh in the past I, I know Canis and I both really enjoy his music I still have not bought his new album I need to make a point of doing that at some point has that not I thought that hadn't come out yet oh, I thought it was out already I, I think so I, I think thought I saw... it was delayed by COVID let me look I'm pretty sure I remember seeing tweets from him like within the last month or two saying that it had been released. And I, I'm pretty sure I commented and replied and said I, I intend to buy it, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So, once again, we've said it before. No, it's out! Christopher Tim's albums, very good. Canis and I both highly recommend them. Yes. If you like the music uh, in Civilization... Yes. Yeah, if you like the music in Civilization, you will enjoy uh, probably any of Christopher Tin's albums. Maybe not God of Love. That one's a little different, but it's still good. So let's see. So anyone else have any uh, any comments or insights into whether they feel like uh, Civ Six was more of a successor to Four than Five, or vice versa? Anybody see any other 
interesting comments in the thread? Well, it wasn't one of his points in his initial post, but Salty Mud pointed out was the argument about tall versus wide, like we've gone back to a wider play as opposed to a tall. Oh, yeah. I approve. I think it's harder to grow cities in addition to expanding uh, in Civ 6 than Civ 4. Like, I, I think tall is not rewarded as much in Civ 6 as 4. Though I think some of the newer policies that they've added where you get the percentage bonuses uh, and stuff like that have definitely improved that situation. Somewhat, but it's late to make it matter, and I'm not, it's not a convincing bonus over acquiring more land. Which becomes the case in Civ 4 as well. But I, I think Civ 4 has the best balance in terms of expansion constraints that we've seen so far. Yeah, and Civ Five, I you know very much went the opposite direction, where Tall was uh, way better. It was there, the there only, were so many percentage. You know, it was the only real options. option. It was the only real option. Uh, you could beat the AI doing some optimal crap, but realistically, you had to play Tall in Civ Five. Yeah, I feel like there's the the, the governors helped with that a lot too, because you've got like Pingala that gives you the percentage uh, bonuses for you know culture and science, and I think also some per citizen bonuses for culture and science, and then you have uh, I want to say it's Reina governor who has the tax collector promotion that gives you gold per citizen, so you know you've got at least two cities there where you're going to want to grow them as much as you can. Somebody mentioned that the governor promotions are almost like. Uh, Civ, 5, Civ 4's version of social policies from Civ 5. Yeah, because they are cumulative. But that's kind of always been the way that the promotions have been. But yeah, yeah in, in effect, they, they do work that way. That's a that's an interesting insight as well. Yeah, and you can use them as an extra, extra focus to a city for a while and then move them to a different city, you know. And... Mobile National Wonders. Th- yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know that there used to be an exploit in, um, what, 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 crap. Rise and fall in Civ Four, where you would build the Olympic Park, and that was basically just a natural wonder, national wonder version of Taj Mahal. And then you would, you'd build the, build it, and then you'd sell the city. So you could build another. <laughs> it's just spam golden ages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't play the sim that had that, but that's uh <laughs> that sounds amazing. It was just beyond the sword. Was it? I don't remember that being I don't remember getting golden age from completing a national wonder in VTS. It was Rise and Fall of Civilization scenario. Oh, okay. Alright. Yeah, I didn't do the scenarios really. <laughs> I enjoyed that one a lot. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the guy who made that, I forget, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's Gabriel something. He's an Italian man. He uh, did his uh, doctorate on the idea behind that game. The idea of simulated history creating new game states. I remember eagerly awaiting uh, that um, mod for Civ Five, and unfortunately, it uh, it never he never finished it. Or if he did, it was long after I stopped playing Civ Five. He released. He didn't release a working version. He released, I think, what he had worked on up to that point. Yeah, I remember he had like a website for it and everything with like screenshots and and stuff like that. And yeah, it just never really uh, uh got finished. Which was a bummer, because I also enjoyed that uh, that mod. I played it a few times in Civ Four. There was a period for of a couple years that I uh, only played that when I played Civ Four. But we all know that I'm a little bit weird anyway, so. And there's plenty of people that play with modded things and have their own sets, and they like Civ that way, not the mainline, so to speak, way. If your preferences are different than mine, it means you're wrong. Now, now, now. (laughs) There's no such thing as a wrong opinion. (laughs) 
<laughs> I would challenge you on that, but let's keep this show family friendly. <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with an opinion that you would conclude has been wrong. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase that. There's no such thing as an opinion uh, that has no right. That I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I guess there's no such thing as an opinion that I would want to kill you for. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> kind of extreme, but I, I can agree with that. What, what would you rather I do? Oh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> there. I'm up from just being wrong, though. <laughs> I bought the album. I would. All right. Mackie's topic now. Uh. <laughs> well, we were going to skip that for feedback. Oh, we were? Okay. We were? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, while well, well, you two were having an opinion fight, <laughs> we decided in chat because, eh, because you know, oh, yeah. you know, okay, I can sum, I can summarize the yield ribbon thing for you. Some people think it's cheaty, some people think it's not. All the information is there in the game; it just puts it up there in a format that you can see it easily without having to dig through a bunch of things. So it's more of a quality of life thing. The information is there. Somebody did suggest. Uh, Making the information show the rank and not the act, you know, like if, like on science, it would show you who's first, second, and third in science, but it wouldn't show you the actual numbers until you got a di- the second level of diplomacy visibility with them. I think, might be a- I think I would be okay with that for some of the yields, but for things like gold, where like there's actual spending power there, uh, and you can just yeah. see that by going into the, the diplomatic screen and then clicking on each and every single friggin' leader to see how much gold they have available, just show that on the main screen UI. Like, yeah. there's no reason to hide that, because it's easily accessible, it's just tedious to do it. Yeah. That's where the line draws. It is, if the information is available anyway, there's no good design argument for making it inconvenient to access. Right. But if you're going to design out access to that information, unless you invest in it, that's a different story. Yeah. Then by all means, hide it however mechanically makes sense. That would be silly, though. Yeah, it just depends. I mean, like, opponents' yields aren't really the hill to die on when it comes to incomplete information, in my opinion. But you could make the case depending on what mechanic we happen to be talking about. The big complaint from the poster, though, has to do with um, being able to see everyone's military strength, like, as a number. Which is me. Yeah, I was going to say you could do it the same way someone suggested to do with the science thing. You just see their rank in military strength. You see who's first, second, third. So, you know, if I'm third and that guy's fourth, I can take him. Yeah, there's still a lot of other factors, too, because are those units land units? Are they naval units? What classes of units are they? Because there's all the rock, paper, scissors stuff going on with combat units that you might have. And and it, I don't think that factors that factor in walls, city walls at all. So I don't think so, no. Yeah, so, I mean, like, someone could have a tiny army but have, like, you know, the high-level walls in all their cities, which, as we've talked about before, is going to make those cities a huge pain to, to, to capture. Yeah, ridiculously so. But on top of that, they could just have a tiny army that's like an era in front of you with a great general in promotions, which is what the player tends to have against the AI on high difficulties. And then you can just kill any arbitrary number of... St- yeah, I, I think the, the military score in the ribbon, though, does factor in the strength of the units, so I think that would be factored into that it number. Sort of does. Like, you can have, like, two rifles or, like, 500 warriors or something. It, it, those aren't, like, real values, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like, right. you could inflate a military score by having heaps and heaps of trash, and the ability to convert that into a threatening advantage is not the same as if you had the same military score worth of units that were technologically equal or especially more advanced than the other Civ. Yeah, one so it, like musket it's man. Not a number in most cases, aside from just giving you a rough idea of the target's unit count, but very rough. Uh, yeah, like one musketman and one you know uh, field cannon is going to mow through you know an army of warriors and archers. Yeah. Or even swords, really. If you've got a great general on the musket. 
I don't think it's quite one shot range. It is if you've got like cores or something as well. Cores and promotions would put you on one shot on swords. But I think in summary, we here at Polycast do not object to the yield ribbon being in the game. Yeah, no. Yeah, 100%. But we are, we are still open to compromised positions like what Mackie suggested. Well, somebody else's suggestion that I relayed, but yes. Hey, Phil, we had feedback. Yes, episode 368 feedback from, uh, from Carl. Carl Blankshine. Would you guys consider going over some opening build strategies? Like what events factors affect what you build and research and spend gold on? Wow, we're going to try to cover this at the tail end of the show? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Because it depends to some degree on your save. It depends whether you have barbs on or off. It uh, depends on the types of neighbors you have. Uh, whether you want to attack itself. them or whether you're expecting them to attack you. Yeah, the map itself, you, you would build differently on Archipelago versus uh, land-only map. Even like huts. like You want more exploring units if you have more expected benefit from finding them uh, because they exist than otherwise. Uh, same deal with city-states. If they are located in a known clump spot in the middle or something that you can't access right away versus you know, if you have a legit chance of finding them with your starting scouter, maybe one you produce early on. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack here. Well, like, all, that's all that... like, oh, what ahead, do we Maggie. do in the first like 50 turns? I mean, map regardless, you usually want to get a, a couple... I mean, you've got the warrior to scout with, but you probably want at least one scout if not two, depending on what kind of map and what size of map. I would really go two. Because your, your top priority is getting your tiles improved and getting the, your cities put down while still living. Like, yeah, that was my next thing on the list as a builder. At least one or two, for, especially for your capital, if you're not... Foremost, improve your best tiles and then get your good city spots down like as fast as you can. And don't forget to use that convenient map pin feature to mark where you want your cities and districts to be. It's very convenient. Yeah. Yeah, because like I'll, I'll be looking at the game in the first few turns thinking, oh, I want to put this here and that there. And you're like, this is a perfect spot for the mountains. And if it's not something obvious, like it's a hill with a bunch of mountains surrounding it, I may want to pin that because I'm not going to remember 20 turns later. Where was I building that again, you know? Yeah, I, I play a lot of games on, you know, continents, maps, you know, with like the, the basic number, what is it, eight civs is the default. Uh, with, you know, barbarians on and tribal villages on and, you know, all the, the default settings mostly. And my opening builds are usually something along the lines of scout, uh, slinger, uh, builder, um, and then maybe another slinger and a warrior, depending on what's going on with uh, nearby barbarians. Uh, a lot of early units, though. Like, like, if you can get away with not doing that and getting your city that many turns sooner... Well, with, with barbarians on, like... I, I found in a... you make a warrior and you, you're busting the the fog. It, it just depends. It depends on the layout of the map. Yeah, and, and like I said, like I said, that depends on on the situation. If there are no barbarians or barbarian camps anywhere around me, then I'm probably going with like another scout or another builder or a settler instead. And I, I'll what I'll usually do is I'll save up money and I'll buy the granary in my capital as soon as I can uh, to get the extra food and growth. Hmm. Yeah, I was about to ask on that one. Monument versus granary, because you also want your borders to go quicker as well. Potato McWhiskey did a, uh, he actually did a monument versus granary. Yeah, maybe we was... should uh, cue that up for uh, next episode to talk about yeah. this more. But in terms of like broad strategies, then you have stuff like, okay, if you want to rush somebody with swords, then you're going to go down for encampments to get a great general out quickly, uh, hook up your iron, and make swords like you're just you're, you're going straight there to get those ready in a reasonable time frame that you can battering down battering ram down the AI walls before they get too strong. And and if it's practical to do so, right? You want to save building things that you can get production bonuses towards from like policies or whatever until you have access to those policies. So you know, slot in a goji right when it's unlocked, and then use that time while you're researching the next civic to pop out as many warriors and slingers as you possibly can, you know? 
So definitely do things like that. You know, swap in, uh, what is it, Ilkum is the builder one, and just pop out builders for as long as that that policy is in place uh, because you're getting those production discounts during that time. I would hold that you would want to do something like this for any opening build you choose, and it's just a matter of uh, which bonuses you're emphasizing. But you, yeah, you always want to be efficient with your policy cards. But then if you're, like, you're not rushing somebody, then making a library... Uh, or, sorry, a... a um, Read a science district in placing that effectively early uh, could be a much better help yeah. than trying to trying to go down for swords. Like you wouldn't tech for swords if you don't need them. Uh, same deal. Like if you're one of those few civs that really benefits from founding your religion, maybe you want to try Byzantium when it drops. You, you probably want to get that holy site down like as soon as you can, so you actually right. get your religion. So yeah, it just depends. And uh, on the topic of districts. Uh, as far as I know, this has not been changed, but when you when you place the district on the map, uh, the game, as far as I know, still locks in the cost of that district. So even if you're not going to finish the district, once you know where you want to put it and you have the population available to place it, just place it. Like, you can switch to building something else that's more important, but you lock in the cost of the district so that it doesn't scale up as you research more techs and civics. Yeah. Although, again, this isn't really an opening build anymore. We're just giving good general tips. Well, for that first district yeah. or two, you know, you're going to plop down that first uh, campus or that first government plaza or holy site or whatever it is. You know, like like I said, plop it down. And then even if you want to switch to building uh, military units or something because barbarians are showing up, you know, just still plop down the district and then switch away to build your units. Well, sure, but you're doing this all game, right? Like True. Yeah. But it's more it's important specific. early in the game because of the snowballing and, you know... The districts are just cheaper then. I guess we're saying the best opening build is a flexible one because things are going to change turn to turn. You may not know you have somebody next to you for 20 turns and, oh, look, it's Montezuma. Well, there goes that campus plan time to build units, you know. I would hope you would know that. (laughs) (laughs) A little sooner, but you never know. Well, I mean, you might have your your opening, you know, warrior or scout killed by barbarians, and then you're, you know, you're in a between a rock and a hard place in that situation because now you do have to dedicate more production to building a replacement or just go Loser. on in ignorance. Barbarians, this isn't Civ Four. Come on now, <laughs> just get eaten by a panther from off screen. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't happen, thankfully. But yeah, I I still feel like scouts are frustratingly flimsy against barbarians. I really wish that like scouts just had like a plus fifty or plus a hundred percent defense versus barbarians, not attack power, but just defense. Or roll that into the survey policy card, like double experience and a bonus against barbarians. I think would not be too much to ask for mm-hmm. that policy card. Because I, I find a lot of situations where my scout just wanders into, you know, a barbarian encampment, and there's, like, three horse archers there. Yeah, and you and, can't see that going into advance because right. you're exploring the map. You're doing you're using the scout as it's intended. Or if the scout had, a, had three visibility, right? Like, that would help, because then you would be able you to see that. The scout would know when to be brave Sir Robin and run yeah, away. Yeah, b- before you're surrounded by them. Uh, yeah, so the, the scouting reconnaissance units in Civ Six do frustrate the heck out of me, and they have since the game released. And I've posted many, many topics uh, ranting about how easy they, how easily they get killed by barbarians in so many games. But apparently, Fraxus disagrees. They won't listen to me. I mean, it would be yeah. useful if they were significantly better in their role, which is recon, than just making a warrior. Yeah, or a, a mounted unit. I mean, like, uh, when before they had the skirmisher unit added to the game in Gathering Storm, like, my best scouting units were basically knights. Like, you get, unlock knights, and I would just build knights to go and cover the rest of the map, because the, at that point, the scouts were useless, because the barbarians were spawning pikemen and crossbows, which would one-hit my scouts anyway. So the skirmisher was a very good addition. It at least makes the scouts viable at that point in the game, but they're still really weak against barbarians and they need easily to bring overwhelmed. Back map they just make everything less annoying if you could just trade maps at some point. <laughs> Even if it's locked to like a technology, like uh, you know, having uh, actually, there is there a cartography? It was, it was locked in Civ Four to paper that you could do something very similar in Civ Six. Like there, there's no realistic barrier to blocking map trades. Yeah, I think the Civ Six has the cartography technology in it, which is the one that I think unlocks Caravels, right? 
So yeah. unlock it's map trading something. with that. But the yeah. the problem with that though is that kind of defeats the purpose of having the caravel though. Well, no, because you you still need to meet people across water and such. Yeah, I suppose that's true. I mean, it would on some maps, but on those maps, the caravel itself tends to not be very important either. And yeah, you're at that point. You're probably only trading maps with the other players on your continent, which probably have not seen the other continent yet, unless you're like way behind in building your caravels. Yeah. Another uh, tip that I have for opening uh, game strategies is uh, pay close attention to your Eureka and Inspiration bonuses for text and civics. Uh, you save yourself a oh, lot of sure. a lot of time on research by you know if there's just something simple that you can do that's going to trigger those. Like one of the things that I like to do is I like to make sure that I build three slingers early in the game when they're dirt cheap before I research archery because the upgrade from slinger to archer is fairly inexpensive it's only like 60 gold which is like not crazy high like you can get that from clearing a few barbarian encampments uh and then i upgrade those three slingers to archers which gives me the inspiration for what is it machinery that unlocks crossbows later in the game so like if you can just do you know simple things like that where you're timing things so that you get those eurekas and those inspirations uh one of the things that i like to do a lot is uh if i don't have the eureka for a tech I'll, but I want that tech sooner rather than later, I'll research half the tech, and then I'll switch to something else, and then work on trying to get that Eureka to finish it for me. Unless it's, like, super critical that I have it now, in which case I don't want to risk the extra time. But if it's not super important to have it right away, then, yeah, I'll, I'll save the time, and I'll switch away and start... Because there's no uh, tech or civic decay in Civ Six either. So half finishing a tech and then doing something else is not going to mean that you're going to lose progress on researching that tech. So by all means, switch away and work on getting those Eurekas. Ugh, tech decay. Imagine. Awful. Is there even tech decay there. anymore? I think there still is, yes. Okay. I haven't messed with the game enough to care in, about production decay. In Civ or in... In Civ Six, uh, production decay. You were asking about? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I haven't seen any production decay. Like if you build something halfway, then switch off it, the, and it's not a wonder. So you can come back to it later. The closest thing that I've seen is if you're in the middle of building a unit, and then you research the next tech that unlocks the next higher unit, and the game decides to cancel building the previous unit, and now you have to spend more production to complete it as the new unit. That gets annoying. Like, I'd rather just, yeah. like, finish finish the heavy chariot so I can pay the gold to upgrade it to the knight. Don't cancel the heavy chariot and then make me spend ten more turns building the darn knight. Or at least roll the hammers you've already spent into the new well, it, unit. Well, it does, it does do that, but the units, okay. the, the production cost of units increases, you know, pretty high. Like, I, I, I could be one or two turns away from finishing that heavy chariot, and then I research stirrups, and now suddenly it's twelve turns remaining to build the knight. Depending on, yeah. you know, game speed and stuff like that. Although and, you could just not finish stirrups until you're ready. True, also. but, you know, you know sometimes you, you make mistakes. Or sometimes just the, like, the, the game is not entirely accurate about, like, when things are going to finish. You know, there's yeah, times... Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> like, sometimes I think that that, uh, that chariot's going to be finished sooner than it actually ends up being finished. And I, I've realized that, oh, there was only one turn left, and stirrups got finished sooner, or for some reason the chariot took longer. Like, that shouldn't happen unless, like, somebody, like, pillages your tile, or moves onto your tile, or something like that. Uh, it, it, it can happen if you, say, like, do something like improve a tile, and, like, the game decides to stop working the, a tile that you were working before and work a different tile. So if it like moves away from that working, should never happen in IBT. well, that, that should only happen during your turn before you hit end. Well, true, but if, if again, if you're not paying super close attention, you might miss it. I'm not saying it changes in oh, yeah. between turns. I'm just saying I didn't notice that it it wasn't what it was supposed to be. It happens. I'm saying that because like there have been if, or there are edge cases, but it has been the case at least in previous civs. Where there are there was bugs where things like that could happen, IBT and screw you. Yeah, I don't know if, if that if it's happening between turns, I'm not paying that super close attention to it. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it's just my mistake. I'm just and it's rare, but sometimes it happens. 
Yeah, the example that comes to mind is I've seen a city that was displayed food positive starve you know, on the after hitting in turn. I forget which uh, Civ that was. I think it was five. The one pro- big problem with Civ six is sometimes the UI is slow about updating uh, certain yields and stuff like that. And I know food growth is one of the ones where that is a particularly egregious problem, where the city will show it's going to starve, that it has a shortage of food, even if you you know switch what tiles you're working and it is going to have enough food. I'm not sure what exactly causes that, but I've seen it happen uh, quite a number of times. That's weird, if you're saying that. I don't recall that, but... Yeah, maybe that is still a thing. I think it, it, I think it most commonly happens after capturing a city. Like, for whatever reason, it just shows that the city's starving, even though it's not starving. Like, as if it's calculating how much food it has, like, in the middle of the flip before it started working uh, all the tiles that hmm. you had. I don't know. It's it's weird. It's hard to explain. Yeah, I kind of remember something like that now that you mention it. So, yeah, any other advice for uh, Carl on what uh, he should be spending the opening of the game doing? We could, we could talk about this for... <laughs> you could almost do an entire episode just on that. Well, yeah. like I said, uh, can us queue up the uh, that Potato McWhiskey video on Granary or Monument for next time, and we can spend half an episode talking about it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> There's a topic, at least. Yeah, that that is true. So, Carl, if you're listening, stay tuned. We might have more advice for you uh, on the next recording. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for listening to Polycast episode 369. I have been Mega Bears fan, along with Canis Albinus. Oh. Uh, the me and team. So long. And Makalua. Forget star cues. What about end cues? What? <laughs> I'll show you an end cue. And just in the nick of time, too, I ran out of water quite a bit ago, and uh, my throat's starting to get hoarse. <laughs> well, let's get out of here. So you horse. My horse is amazing. Civilization 3, 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6 Sound Clips. Copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright the Polycast at thepolycast.net.